Welcome to Wargaming Recon. I am your host, Jonathan J. Reinhardt. Wargaming Recon is the longest-running full-time reading podcast on the planet. No, that sounds like myself. It's true. I assure you. Uh, this is episode 166, Gladius Publications with Henry Hyde. For all of you who are new and long-time listeners alike, I want to let you know about one thing. We talk about a lot of things on the show, and there's no way you can remember them all. You like to listen to podcasts while you're commuting, you're painting figures, you're doing all sorts of stuff. No one sits at a computer anymore and listens to a podcast, or at least I don't. So it's hard to remember everything. I try to make it easy for you. You only have to remember one thing, the link to the show notes where we have all sorts of stuff that we cover. Remember, wargamingrecon.com slash WR166. That's wargamingrecon.com slash WR166, and that'll have all the things you need. So without further ado, I want to welcome our very, very special guest. I'm talking about, of course, the one and only Mr. Henry Hyde, and I could go on and list all the things he's done, but really, then the show would be over because he's such a talented individual, and he's doing this new adventure here that I am very excited about, and I think a lot of you will be as well. If you are not familiar with it, you will become very familiar soon. So Henry, welcome to the show. Thanks very much indeed, Jonathan. It's great to be here. I can't tell you how excited I was when I first heard you were going into publishing on your own with Gladius Publications. I think it's a perfect fit for you. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much. That's the first thing. Um, the thing is, it's uh, initially it had a specific purpose for me to self-publish my own material, because as you know, and you've probably noticed just in the last few days, I also am trying to write fiction as well as um, wargaming stuff. And initially my thoughts were that uh, Gladys Publications would be an outlet for me to do purely my own stuff, um, to self-publish my own fiction when it's finished. Let's uh, steady on, everyone. It's not finished yet. To publish my own fiction and to publish other kind of um, non-fiction works besides it, you know, not necessarily anything to do with wargaming, but kind of military history, and then obviously some wargaming stuff. Although um, I'm, having to, I'm having to think hard about that because, as you know, I've already got contracts with Pen and Sword, the publishers here in the UK, to write, um, uh, hang on, I'm counting. I think it's three more books for sure at the moment with possibilities of a fourth. Um, but um, <clears throat> there's, for a number of reasons, uh, life has become quite, um, well, I tried to simplify it, but it's become more complicated recently. I need to tell a kind of a, a bit of backstory and then we can sort of move on with the Gladius. Um, just recently, a couple of months ago, I made a momentous decision regarding um, Miniature War Games, the magazine, the monthly magazine that I edit, uh, as you know. Uh, and that decision was uh, <clears throat> that I would relinquish doing the design and layout work in the magazine um, as a step in the direction of freeing myself up to be able to pursue more of my own creative projects. One of the problems I've had since um, the days of Battle Games, which obviously Battle Games um, are, you know, got sold to Atlantic Publishers back in 2011, and then uh, Atlantic Publishers uh, sold the combined miniature war games with Battle Games onto uh, Warner's publications last year, about, what's that, 15, 16 months ago now. Um, and the problem has been, as we've discussed previously, that uh, when you are the editor and designer of a monthly magazine, man, that's a lot of work. <laughs> uh, and I've been working some really crazy hours. And on top of those really crazy hours, I've been trying to continue with my own creative projects, uh, whether that's writing more war games books or anything else. And it just reached the point where, man, it was killing me. Um, I mean, almost quite literally, my health had been taking some hits and I was having to, you know, whoa, this, this isn't good for me. Um, and so uh, I, you know, it's a difficult decision because obviously doing the design and layout of the magazine is reasonably lucrative. 
but I decided that if I was ever going to make any progress with my other creative projects, I needed to take a deep breath and jump off the edge of the cliff, basically. Um, you know, in, in terms of what I lost in income when I made this decision a couple of months ago, you know, we're talking about 13 or 1400 pounds a month. So what's that? Fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars. Uh, I'm not sure what the exchange rate is. Maybe, maybe a little bit more. Um, which you know, to some people, wow, that's a wage in itself, um, and it is. I mean, when you've got a mortgage to pay and bills and you know credit cards and that kind of stuff to pay off, it, it's it's kind of mad. You know, it's it's so I've either been very brave, Jonathan, or I've been really stupid, and time will tell. It's my case initially a bit headspace to think about right. Well, how am I going to take things forward? And if I'm going to be doing things other than you know everyone knew me as the editor of miniature war games and knows me as that. But if I'm creating doing this other thing, I need to have a, a brand effectively to do this. Um, now, it just so happens that well, I've been a graphic designer for 26 years, and and a very brief potted history was that I became a graphic designer back in 1991. Uh, and um, was in partnership with some someone else. I was in a business partnership, and we grew our business to be one of the most successful agencies in this town, Brighton and Hove, on the south coast of England. And um, around about 1996, I started doing websites, and so we created another brand called HA Wired. So it was HA Design, Henry and Andrew, that's original, wasn't it? HA Design. And then HA Wired was sort of the digital arm. And I kind of took over leadership of that and actually set up a second office to deal with this kind of thing. And then at the end of, right at the end of 1999, I split with my business partner. We were just like a band who played too many gigs together, you know. Um, and so then it was weird because we, we, it was a very gentlemanly split and we said, well, you know, he can carry on calling that his business HA Design. I could carry on calling mine HA Wired. But it's a bit like the house that never got sold after the the divorce you know and i felt like oh you know it was good at its time but i'm also doing more paper-based design as well and it doesn't really fit me anymore brought in a kind of uh, a business consultant a very you know bright woman who was full of ideas very helpful and she said, suggested to me, well, you know, HA Wired is great, it, you know, in terms of if you're only delivering a digital product, product uh, or service, then that's great because, you know, the logo even had sort of lots of email and internet symbols in it and stuff. Um, but the thing is, you're also doing other things. So what you need to do is get away from having a brand that's talking about what you do and creating a brand that's basically an expression of you as a person. Because effectively, when you're self-employed, your customers are buying you as much as they're buying your product or service, right? Um, so um, it was around about that time that the movie Gladiator had come out. Uh, people may remember Gladiator. It was quite a famous movie. And um, so that was, you know, uh, I realized that that movie spoke to me on many levels. And so what I did was I um, uh, came up with the name Gladius, which is obviously the name of the Roman sword that, uh, you know, the, the Roman soldiers and gladiators used. Um, and that kind of stuck, and I really enjoyed working with that name, and it was intriguing for customers. It got a conversation going, you know, like, oh, you know, where's that word come from and all the rest of it. So that was kind of uh, kind of good. Um, but, uh, you know, along, um, along with that um, was that, I, you know, moving fast forward to kind of the early 2000s, uh, the idea of Battle Games magazine was born, you know, around about 2004, 2005. And then obviously the first issue of Battle Games came out in 2006. And the Gladius, you know, that took over my life. So the Gladius brand, you know, I, I had a few existing clients. And I carried on doing bits and pieces for them. But essentially that kind of got put on the shelf. So just recently, you know, what with this decision, this momentous decision to pursue, you know, a more creative life, and I was, you know, it just smacked me around the head. You know, don't go trying to create another brand. Don't reinvent the wheel. You've already got one. 
So all I did really was uh, brought out and dusted off that uh, Gladius brand and just changed it. was originally Gladius Creative Communication, and I just changed it to Gladius Publications. The kind of brand was born. Uh, so that, anyway, I, and I count myself lucky because I know, because I've designed lots of corporate identity people that you know that's a process that can take weeks or months to come up with you know the right corporate identity whereas you know it just slapped me upside the head straight away <laughs> so that was kind of an afternoon's work as opposed to a month's work um so that i managed to get off the ground and then you know my advice to anyone is the moment these days you have an idea go out and buy the domain names and all that kind of stuff, set up the Twitter account, set up the Facebook page and all that. So you probably noticed, you along with you know several hundred other people, noticed kind of overnight, like, blimey, what's all this Gladius stuff that's appeared? Facebook pages and Twitter accounts and what have you. Great, and I got a mailing list going as well, which is now already, without me doing anything really, has already got, I think, 300 subscribers on it which is you know nowhere near the level i wanted to be but man 300 subscribers when i've basically done no marketing whatsoever is you know fairly astonishing you know people people buy online courses how to get your first 100 mailing list subscribers and i got 300 you know almost overnight so no that's fantastic and obviously i'm really really grateful to those people who have signed up because uh, you know, from the point of view of anyone starting a new enterprise, um, it's obviously, you know, when you've got that level of support before you've done anything, really, that's fantastic because that is a sign that you have a core support group. These are people who are really keen on what you're going to produce. They're really interested in what you're doing. And also, you know, it's like when I first started Battle Games magazine, I think I've told you, I, I back, you know, nowadays we call it a Kickstarter. But I did, you know, Kickstarter didn't exist. So what I did was I, I pre-sold subscriptions to the magazine. You know, it was the old school wargaming group. And, I, and you know, they, to be honest, they'd encouraged me to do battle games as a, as a project. So I said to them, look, ha, I've got no money. Uh, can you help out? And I can't remember. Or someone piped up and said, oh, you know, well, why don't we do... What's in fact a very old fashioned idea, uh, you know, centuries old, this idea of pre subscribing to a book or pamphlet or something of that kind to cover the costs in setting it up. So, uh, you know, uh, I can't remember, it was about 100, 150 people, something like that, actually put their hands in the pockets and, and helped me get battle games off the ground, uh, which was fantastic. And so, in a sense, uh, this is kind of a very similar thing where there's 300 people. They're basically saying, look, we're, we're sitting here. We're waiting. Sell us something. Uh, and believe me, folks, I'm I'm working on that. I really am. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how the, the, the Gladius, the genesis of the, of the Gladius publications thing. And it was the idea was, yeah, it was going to be my stuff. And obviously, when you're doing something like this and you've made the decision to kiss goodbye to quite a substantial chunk of income, your immediate concerns is, well, okay, how, what can I do to bring in money as quickly as possible? So, um, I mean, I did two things. I did a, 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 a series of kind of map squares, you know, terrain squares that you've probably seen that was a giveaway for people who joined up on the mailing list, uh, which seemed to go down quite well. So I did a second volume. Basically, I did a load more with more, you know, forests and trees and roads and hills and whatnot, uh, and put that on as kind of the first standalone product. Uh, and, you know, people have been buying that, you know, not in vast numbers. Let's not get carried away here, but it's very gratifying to see. But that's not, you know, I I can, I did that because I know I can do the graphics. And it was an idea that, in fact, I'd first done in my book, The Wargaming Compendium. I'd actually done a page of, you know, terrain square ideas so that newcomers to the hobby could get an idea of, well, if you're buying terrain squares, these are the sort of permutations that will be on them idea because it you know this is why i did it for gladys it suddenly dawned on me oh actually they could have a life kind of on their own so that was cool um but obviously what i want to do is more written stuff you know words are my thing 
But in the meantime, as soon as people got wind of the fact that, oh, you know, Henry's available, that <laughs> kind of thing, um, I immediately got some emails and phone calls, which was great, from other people in the industry who I can't say, unfortunately, yet, although uh, it will become known, who basically said to me, oh, look, well, actually, Henry, we've got this project and that project. Would you be interested in helping out? Obviously, for money. And I, you know, I thought about five seconds and thought, yeah. <laughs> uh, so at the moment, I'm actually in the process of laying out a, a set of rules for someone that I, I, I can't reveal yet. Um, I've been invited to do um, a, a part of a for someone. And also, funnily enough, going way back to the days when I was originally using Gladys as a brand, I bumped into one of my old clients from about 15 years ago who said, for whom I'd actually designed his corporate identity and his website. And he said, oh, God, Henry, th thank God I've bumped into you. I, I want someone to update my website, but I don't trust anyone except you, <laughs> which is like, you know, that's really touching. That's lovely. Um, I didn't have the heart to tell him that, oh, really, do you know, I don't really want to be doing website work, but hey, I need the money. So I've got that as well to do. So that's great. Um, but then what I really didn't expect at all, people started emailing me saying, oh, Henry, if you're going to be publishing stuff, would you consider publishing my stuff? Uh, which was like, oh, crikey. Um, so, in other words, would, and, and I mean, to you on the outside, it probably seems obvious, but to me, duh, <laughs> I hadn't imagined that anyone else would want me to publish their stuff, right? Um, so, yeah, I, and so I am in negotiation with and moving forward with, um, well, it's now three people I'm in discussions with um which and I'm, I'm quite certain there may well be more and i've made it clear what the deal is you know i'm i'm not a big publishing company i can't afford to pay advances and we can come back to that but there's other reasons why advances these days are um you know they're not what they used to be but the deal i've offered to people is right i'll pay 25 percent royalties um and you know the art but i'll take because i know most publishing companies do virtually no marketing for authors these days as i know to my cost um so you know i'll help you with the marketing and obviously i'll produce a nice product the, the product will be primarily digital so it may be pdf or you know kindle or ibook or you know whatever format uh and potentially print on demand that will depend title by title but obviously nowadays with amazon create space you can upload a title which then gets sold via kindle but also people can buy it print on demand just one copy at a time which is one of the amazing things about these days so uh and they've all said yeah fine <laughs> um which Obviously, as a businessman, that, that leads me to think, rats, I offered them too much money. <laughs> but no, uh, I'm happy about that um, because um, I've, it, I feel like that's giving them a fair deal, but it also means that I'll be earning enough out of it to justify the time, obviously, I've got to put into doing the design and layout of these things uh, and the editing and that kind of stuff and maybe paying for a proofreader, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I kind of wasn't expecting that, but obviously, um, useful income stream. Uh, um, and, uh, well, two... I, Two of the people I, I can reveal I'm talking to at the moment. One is uh, Mick Zace. His full name is A. Michael Zace. I've never asked him what the A stands for, actually. Probably Anthony or something, isn't it? But A. Michael Zace, who readers of Miniature War Games will remember, I hope, because he's written loads of articles about the Mongols and also wrote an article a while ago about painting 10 millimeter miniatures and making scenery for 10 mil or was it six mil miniatures and stuff um so he's quite well known and highly respected particularly for his mongol 
work. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's been kind of fascinating, really, um, that um, these other people want me to do their stuff as well. So, yeah, that's kind of groovy. <laughs> It, it almost sounds like maybe you're going to be even busier with your new venture than before, but probably a little more of an ebb and flow sort of setup. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, <clears throat> the thing is uh, that what I need in order to pursue my um, creative uh, work, what I need is uh, what's in the trade called a passive income. You know, if I was extremely wealthy, that would be money I've got in the bank that's earning interest. And, you know, hey, I'm just living off the interest. I don't actually have to do any real work at all. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> uh, but the thing about digital products, or well, I can tell you that uh, people are still buying Battle Games Issue 1 via my PayHip site, which is now, man, that's 10 years ago. You know, March 2006 is more than two, 10 years ago, um, which to me is astonishing. But people still, because there's a lot of people in the world, are still stumbling upon it going, hey, what's this? I've never seen this before. And some of them, once in a while, are even going, oh, my God, and there's 30 issues, and they buy the lot. <laughs> and so suddenly my PayPal account goes ka-ching. I say, like, wow, that's handy. Uh, you know, even, and I sometimes I wake up in the morning and there's there's already some money in my account, which is just fantastic. You know, this is this is what online, uh, you know, some people would call it monetizing, but online trading. This is what it's all about. Where essentially you set something up, you do the work once, but then it carries on paying you potentially forever. You know, uh, whereas when you're a graphic designer, you know, when I'm doing the design and layout for miniature war games obviously they pay me a design fee per issue and for other clients i get paid by the hour or by the day so you can only get paid as much as you know the hours you can literally work in a day and if you're prepared to as i have on many occasions over the years if you're prepared to sometimes work 24 hours a day uh because you need the money <clears throat> then obviously you know you learn more but at the same time you're killing yourself quite literally <clears throat> so that's not a sensible way to go about things so the um this is you know the the core idea of gladys was to do two things was to give me an outlet for my own self-published work so to help produce a passive income and uh i've, I've been thinking you know out of the box uh thinking around the subject and it dawned on me that another way that i can also kind of expand the idea is by providing online courses um and so you may have seen a cryptic facebook post a post of mine uh, a couple of weeks ago or whatever when i first had that kind of ding eureka moment <clears throat> with a new adaptation of the logo gladius academy the idea being that it would be to provide high quality high value courses for people uh who really want to learn how to do something not really as a hobby uh because obviously this this is the other thing you encounter there's loads of youtube videos and stuff out there and uh, other sites like udemy and that kind of stuff where you can download you know um how to tie your shoelaces or whatever it might be, you know. Um, short videos, even some of them quite long, you know, might be an hour long on how to do something specific in a piece of software or whatever. Whereas, you know, and, and so there's no value. There's no point me, you know, recreating the wheel and duplicating something and expecting something people to charge for something that they'll just turn and say, well, hang on, Henry, I can already get this for free. Thank you very much indeed. And so, you know, I've had a, big brainstorm with myself and obviously i've come up with ideas oh i could i could show people how to paint war games miniatures and that kind of thing but hello there's loads of really good videos out there already uh there's loads of tutorials in magazines uh, uh christy at war game soldiers and strategy you know she's got done a whole series of youtube videos and they're really good man you know if she's watching hi christy um but they are they're really good and so you know 
who would want to watch me, Henry Hyde editor, teach it? Well, this is how, here's a 12 step course to painting war games miniatures. You know, and man, and it's $200. And you're going to go, ah, oh, thanks, Henry, bye. <laughs> so, no, this, and, you know, I've had wargaming friends who've kind of picked up on the fact I'm doing this, who've sent me a lot of helpful suggestions. And 99% of them I've looked at and gone, nah, no, no, because it's already available out there for free. The, the areas that I'm probably going to be doing something or, or doing the teaching around, of, I've got to tell you now, I, uh, from what I can tell, they're not going to have anything to do with wargaming. Uh, they may have something to do with military history. I mean, there's a, there is a potential for doing a course of, you know, military history for dummies or something of that kind, which base, but more specifically aimed at the target market, perhaps like writers, you know, fellow writers who are uh, self-publishing or they want to move from being romance writers into historical fiction writers or whatever. Um, so that's something I might do. Uh, but, you know, there are things, you know, there are, I've been a graphic designer for all these years. So I do have very marketable skills. And there are people out there who think, right, well, uh, you know, actually, I'd like to be a graphic designer or learn how to save money by being able to use graphic design tools in my business or to help me, you know, create and publish my own works you know to self-publish so there is it's more likely you're going to see me coming up with uh, courses to do with you know how to use adobe indesign and photoshop to design your own self-published book you know and then upload it to amazon and all the rest of it because there are other bits of software there's a piece of software called scrivener that you may have heard of uh where there's a guy called joseph michael who's a great bloke and he, he does a fantastic course on Scrivener, you know, kind of Scrivener for dummy, dummies or how to learn Scrivener fast, something like that. Um, so he's already done Scrivener. So it's like, I, I think I'm, I'm going to be looking at a more specific professional level software like Adobe InDesign and Photoshop and that kind of stuff. Where, you know, there might be someone in the war games field who's interested, who happens to, you know, at the moment they just use Photoshop for sharpening and brightening their photos of their miniatures but they also might have some kind of association in the print trade or be thinking of branching out having a career change into graphic design that kind of stuff so but that's also the kind of thing where someone will think yeah i don't mind paying you know a few hundred dollars for that because that's going to help me to earn a few thousand dollars every year right uh, and also, it's the kind of thing I could, if you're charging a few hundred dollars for a course, you can make it more affordable by, by saying to people, if you pay me up front, it's $300, or you can pay me $50 a month for 12 months or whatever, you know, to help make it more affordable for you. So that's kind of where the Gladius Academy ideas, you know, whirling around and writing, you know, um, some people who, who, I put, uh, I put out a call on the Gladius Facebook page, you know, hey, guys, you know, this is an idea I've got. What kind of courses would you be interested in having? And again, there was a, quite an interesting mixture. One of them was writing war games rules, <laughs> which is, well, how long's a piece of string, you know? Um, it's quite interesting. But there was the, the writing thing came up several times from different people writing with clarity or writing business reports that kind of stuff so who knows and obviously your listeners and viewers if they have any amazing ideas that that and i this is where i have to say you know that they think specifically they would like to hear from me you know that, that what is it that henry hyde you think could could teach people bring give you know better value than someone else teaching it you know because of my unique experience uh you know in graphic design business uh magazine editing uh and writing in general rather than just oh henry could could you do a course on flower arranging <laughs> guys <laughs> I can see you're imagining it, Jonathan. <laughs> oh dear. I, I think you're spot on though with the um 
<laughs> I'm sorry, with the, it's so professional of me. With the uh, the passive income, though, uh, I do that on a very very small scale. You know, for the for the show here, um, I put episodes up on Wargame Vault, and people can choose to. Uh, they pay what they want, basically, because I kind of feel weird charging people for my show, my one of my ethos for here. And this is because I have a regular full, you know, nine to five kind of job. But I feel yep. this should be free for people. Not that it, I, it doesn't have value. I think it has immense value for the right person. But mm. in general, I don't want to say, like, you need to pay me a membership fee in order to get into my membership site to get this. But at the same time, yep. if someone wants to, you know, send a little something my way as thanks... I, for me, the passive income I, is kind of the best. So people can pay whatever they want mm. on Wargame Vault and they get episodes, and they've have. So I'll get these sales notifications all the time, and often they'll say, oh, you know, they just got it for free, which is great because I like to spread the word, and I like to think, should I ever flip the switch and go, well, maybe I will dub my 9 to 5 and, and make a go of it as doing, which mm. I would love to do someday. Is it realistic? Probably not. Uh, but I'm building up that audience. And then also not as passive uh, per se, but the whole um, Patreon kind of thing for me has worked really well be between that and having a sponsor for the show. No, no matter yeah. how many episodes I put out, the money's there. The money comes in uh, every month. My backers on Patreon, it comes in and, and so forth. And yeah. uh, I mean, there's that trust involved where I'm going to have to produce something for them. And, uh, but at the same time, like it shows up like clockwork. It comes in, I, I see it, it goes on the account and, and so yeah. forth. And, it, and it's nice to have that because, um, again, it's a completely different environment than, uh, like you needed to pay your bills. I, I needed to keep the, the show going. And if the show doesn't go, yeah. like, you know, that's that. Um, it, it'd be sad, but I'm not going to get evicted from my house for, um, yeah, yeah. didn't do whatever. I think you mentioned Patreon there. That's that is a really interesting model, and I think it it definitely works for things like podcasts and vidcasts. Uh, there's um, a name that I often mention when uh, certainly when um, Neil Shuck and I are chatting on View from the Veranda. Uh, a woman called Joanna Penn, who you may well have heard of, uh, goes under the brand of the Creative Pen for her nonfiction work. And she is what just phenomenally uh, productive in the field of self-publishing and that kind of stuff. And um, she runs a podcast um, based on Patreon. <clears throat> she has Patreon supporters. Now, because she's got, <clears throat> excuse me, now got, oh, crikey, several tens of thousands of visitors to her website, her Patreon income is quite substantial. I, I'm not sure how what level it's up to now, but it's certainly you know in the probably thousands of dollars per month, uh, which is hugely impressive, obviously. And, and I think for things that are appearing regularly, like a podcast or a vidcast, it's a it's a thing that works well because people feel, feel like, yeah, well that's fair enough. I like I support her, you know. I I think you know I can't remember what I'm about to sponsoring her for but i don't know $10 a month or whatever it is you know because i think she does a podcast every single week and sometimes two and i'm thinking they're all really good top level stuff with you know she's interviewing amazing people who always you know if i listen to come away having scribbled a load of notes because man that's really useful that's really interesting oh i didn't know that wow gosh you know i'm glad i didn't miss that so i think in that kind of sense uh you know patience good model because it feels as a customer if you like it feels like yeah i'm paying a subscription and i don't mind that um i think um it's more difficult for people like myself who are just you know hey guys please send me some money every month so i can be just generally creative <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be lovely? Uh, perhaps I should try it. Perhaps I should try it, Jonathan. Just stick a Patreon button on my blog or something. Hey, I um, mean, you never know. I know an independent musician. He actually is the one who's created the um, the theme song that I use. And he has a Patreon campaign. He gets about $900 per item that goes out. And if he were, if he were to switch it to per month, he'd be about fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month. Uh, and his per items are are songs, and he's gonna release albums. He does whole albums this way instead yeah. of the other. He self releases all of them. 
he does really well. He, yeah. he tours, I mean, and, and that kind of stuff too. But uh, for him, this has worked really well. And I've talked to him about it because I was kind of curious. And he lives generally local to me in the New England area. And he mm -hmm. kind of just views it as these are people who like what I'm doing. They get me is the phrase he kind of likes to yeah, use. Yeah. And they, they want to support him no matter how, what. So whether it's buying his stuff or just allowing him to create the things. And so yeah. they, they support. And I mean, I, I backed them uh, too for a while. And uh, so it's working really well for him. And this is how he pays his bills. So I, I was kind of intrigued by that, that it's worked for him mm -hmm. like that. And I could see it working for other uh, types of people, other types of creators, not necessarily everyone. Cause like you said, uh, it, it varies uh, for the, uh, mm -hmm the return on investment, so to speak, uh, for people yeah, yeah. and for what your supporters are going to feel like. Are they going to feel it's worth it uh, waiting, you know, months for a new book to come out? Well, maybe if you release chapters from time to time or that kind of stuff, yeah. uh, sneak peeks. I, I think you, you've touched on something there. I think if I was a short story writer and so I produce kind of ep monthly episodes or something like that uh, or monthly stories, I think that, that's uh, probably a, an acceptable model. Uh, and I, I haven't really looked into it, but I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if I discovered that there are writers who do that, if they're primarily short story writers as opposed to novelists, mm -hmm. uh, that they could potentially have success with Patreon. Because I know a lot of novelists, I know a lot of non uh, 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 self-published novelists and non-fiction writers now uh, and mostly what they do is they're selling complete books so they may well have links on their blog or site or whatever linking to their book either to buy direct from them or via Amazon or iTunes or whatever it happens to be uh, but I haven't yet and it is only yet I haven't yet come across anyone who's um, earning money you know based on a Patreon income for smaller shorter works of fiction what tends to happen is that people will use uh, short works of fiction as a teaser to kind of prime people for the novel that's coming so i have seen writers for example write a short story based around one of their central characters to kind of sell that character to the potential readers so that they're going oh wow you know this guy sounds intriguing you know i want to find out more about them well you can find out more in the complete novel when it's published you know in november 2017 or whatever um but there's going to be a gap between you reading this little you know the, the final thing um so that's kind of uh tricky the other thing ways that I'm also looking at this, which is, uh, example, in uh, software, in Adobe InDesign or Photoshop, what you can do is uh, create templates for people to use for designing and laying out their book. There is a guy, uh, and I think his URL is actually thebookdesigner.com, Joel Freelander, that's his name. He's an American guy who's been around for a long time and, and very cleverly, you know, grabbed that domain name and made a niche for himself um, several years ago now. It's quite a few years ago. But there's no one in the UK doing that. So effectively, I could be the, the British Joel Freelander pr providing a similar kind of service. Because it's, I mean, it's one of those cultural things, isn't it, that um, a lot of online courses and stuff um, that, you know, uh, obviously come with a, a, a national style and you guys over in America, you tend to be really kind of gung-ho and yeah, 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 let's do it kind of thing. Whereas we British are often a bit more restrained, <laughs> a bit more kind of uh, circumspect. And so what, uh, you know, I think there might be a market for is a slightly more kind of um, – or a less frantic approach, shall we say. Um, still enthusiastic, but just kind of toned down slightly. So, yes, we're encouraging, we're nurturing, but we're not necessarily, you know, claiming that, man, we're out to conquer the world here. You know, it's like, really? All I want is a book template, mate. You know, <laughs> do me a favor. But you, I'm sure I don't have to tell you there are people like this out there. Um, it's. I think the thing is, it's like, 
people uh, a lot of people like to take courses or learn things without feeling like they're buying life insurance right because uh, you know I used to be a life insurance salesman and I can remember the first company I worked for uh, I think they've gone bust now actually but I think it was a it was either an American or Canadian Canadian company I think it might be Canadian but their training their sales training was all really gung-ho and they wanted everyone to get up and stand on the desks and do all that kind of you know uh, what's his name Harold Robbins stuff isn't it the motivational speaker uh, so I think there's a there is a, a, a niche for people who want just a slightly calmer <laughs> environment. We shall see. But obviously, if you have any great ideas of things that you think, well, heck, I'd pay Henry to learn that. Man, let me know. <laughs> I think you've hit something, though, with the online courses. I've done a, a lot of the lynda.com ones. They're owned by yeah. LinkedIn now, and they talk about you know all sorts of stuff. It's very involved kind of uh, coursework, and I do it through work, so it doesn't cost me anything because my, my employer has a, a whole, you know, things set up and i know other podcasters who've done this sort of thing too to teach search engine optimization and uh wordpress stuff and all that kind of thing and they've found that it's not people like me who are doing it it's companies who are doing it and it's the professionals and that's really where they've kind of pivoted to so that they can still yeah. do whatever else they're doing but that they're reaching these customers who have a huge need for it so it, it helps them it they're able to help other people and share their knowledge and then they do get the you know, every so often the everyday kind of guy uh, or woman who is coming in and wants to do this sort of stuff. Uh, they, the people I've spoken to who've created these kind of things, they've said it's been re very rewarding, uh, a lot more time intensive than they would have thought. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that for me, the thing that's kind of interesting is the different ways that the people have approached it. Uh, so like you have that lynda.com kind of um perspective where it's a, a video tutorial basically but you follow along there's a script there's worksheets and so forth uh, some of the uh, very well-known podcasters out there uh, they'll do a whole kind of interactive chat sort of thing so that they have the video you, know, you watch it's almost like doing a, a live streaming event so you kind of have these different yeah. Methods and then when your live stream is done, uh, you get the recording and you can keep and use that forever others do sort of a, a mastermind sort of setup where uh, they have this whole mastermind group, but you pay to get into it, and then you have all this sort of stuff that then becomes available for you, all these online classes and so forth. And so so many different ways to do it, and I don't think there's any really wrong way. Uh, it just kind of depends on what you want to do and who you want to reach. And you're going to get yeah, people I mean, definitely. Well, the, the I think this is the thing, though, Jonathan, that, well, first of all, uh, you mentioned Linda.com. Man, I remember when they first started, they were the guys producing all the really big, thick, kind of missing manual things for your computer software. They've been around, well, since the 1990s, that's for sure. Um, so they've got a pedigree, they, you know, highly impressive. I think you, you hit on another thing there, which is where saying that the audience quite often for technical matters isn't the general public, it's businesses. It's businesses who want to train their staff to be able to do stuff. And the other thing about businesses, they're prepared to pay a much bigger price tag than Joe Schmo, right? <clears throat> so that's something I am... Um, kind of thinking about the I can't remember what the third thing was so back to you Jonathan <laughs> you said something else there um the uh, the mastermind groups which is I mean some of them are free some are but it's kind of the same sort of setup where um you get into this sort of club almost and you're able to have uh, I, I guess the closest thing for people who aren't familiar with it would be if you're an author you, you join kind of like a mutual critique group where you you share what you're working on um you made this yeah. progress and that kind of stuff or a group therapy i guess or for people and that sort of thing but you know for this specific purpose of whatever it is you're creating whether it's you're a graphic designer you're uh, a web programmer or whatever and you get into or podcast there's a lot for podcasters and you get into that kind of setup and you have the support but then you get access to all these extra resources which is kind of cool yeah. Yeah. i hear you go um, so, oh yeah, well, this is welcome to the coast, man. You know, <laughs> this is Brighton and Hove. I'm about, well, less than a mile from the sea here. So um, we get lots of seagulls nesting on the roof just outside here. I'm pointing, but there's seagulls nests on the roof out there. Uh, but anyway, uh, the other interesting thing, you know, sort of um, kind of wrapping up the gladiest thing because people are probably sick of it by now, is that with all these other ideas, obviously, uh, um, 
the passive income. <clears throat> the challenge for me is making sure that I, I don't get completely sidetracked into you know publishing all this stuff for other people and doing all these other things and then i end up with well man what happened to that time i wanted for myself to do my own creative writing <clears throat> so um yeah i've been uh, kind of working away at a novel for a long time or a series of novels in fact um and to be honest, with all kinds of pressures um, and, and stuff that I'm, I can't go into at the moment, but, you know, job pressures and things, uh, it's been a real struggle to kind of do my own writing. Um, and I'd kind of, um, I had an, a novel that I'd written quite a large chunk of. I can't remember if we've discussed in the past, but I'd, I'd written about... Oh, 40,000 words, 30 or 40,000 words of, uh, of an, a novel that was intended to be an, the opening novel of a series. <clears throat> uh, and it was an idea that I had, I had the germ of a, ooh, a long time ago. I mean, we're talking probably 20 years ago. That's when the first germ of it came. And I kind of knocked it around and I'd kind of sat down, smacked out a big chunk of this novel. <clears throat> probably, oh God... 15 years ago now <clears throat> and the trouble it was and often is for authors that if you if you start work on something and then put it to one side when you then come back to it you realize mm, do you know what i'm not sure i'm so interested in this anymore uh, and the reason in my case was quite simply that the person i'd had as the lead character in the novel when i reread it through with the intention of kind of getting it going again i think my first reaction was this guy's a jerk, <laughs> you know, I, I just, it was a character that suited me when I was a younger man, you know, in my kind of 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever. But now I'm 55, I looked at this guy and thought, you know, um, this isn't the person whose story I want to tell anymore. Uh, it, it's a very different person whose story I want to tell because also, over the years, of course, we, you, you get influenced by so many other things, the, the movies you watch, the books you read, the, you know, the, the other stuff you get interested in. And I was interested in an older, kind of much darker character. You know, let's not say it's autobiographical, <laughs> uh, because my lead character does some things that probably would be illegal, you know, chopping people's heads off left, right and centre. But... Um, it definitely needed rewriting. So I kind of, um, uh, it's a few months ago now, uh, earlier this year, I sat down and completely re-outlined the novel. And I think this is the other thing that made a difference because the first time I tried writing this story, I, I was doing it entirely by the seat of my pants. You know, I was definitely a pantser, as it's called in the trade. And I w hadn't outlined at all. It was literally sit down and just smack out as many words as possible and see how far I can get with it. So actually, it's quite impressive. I got as far as I did, but it was also the explanation of why I kind of ran out of steam and what happened was the plot had gone off in all sorts of directions and I had far too many characters to deal with. Um, and it was just, you know, classic kind of, beginner's first novel syndrome it kind of sounds like so, george rr R. martin well you know exactly the th the difference is that he and stephen king he's another famous pantser has you know he's got nothing else to do all day except just sit down there and write whatever he wants to write and he's got it all formed in his head he doesn't have the distraction of trying you know dealing with a day job right uh, whereas the rest of us do, and it can be bad enough if you're trying to pick up a piece of writing like the following day, you know, if you can, can only do a bit of writing for, you know, one or two hours a day or whatever it is, uh, it's really important that you're able to retain where you're going with the plot or the characters or whatever in your head, at least to a degree. Um, I still believe that there's a lot you can do by effectively pantsing. There's a, there's a, uh, I think he's the most prolific author uh, on earth. Uh, it's not George R.R. R. Martin. Um, uh, it's a guy called Dean Wesley Smith, an American guy called Dean Wesley Smith, who has written, let me get this right, I think it's something like 450 novels. Google him. If you've never heard of him, guys, 
Google him, Dean Wesley Smith. And he writes in all sorts of genres. He writes sci-fi, he writes romance, he writes thrillers, all sorts. And he's married to another highly prolific writer called Christine Catherine Rush, R-U-S-C-H, I think, Rush. Uh, who is, you know, the female equivalent of Dean Wesley Smith, which is just as well, because otherwise I can't imagine how they'd live together. They'd never see one another, right? So um, so he's kind of the ultimate pantser, and he's written uh, a lot of really useful short books on how he does it. And I've seen him write a novel, a 60,000-word novel, in a week, right? Extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, I saw you. <laughs> Folks at home, Jonathan's eyebrows just went way up. But yeah, I've seen. But I know that's possible because uh, you know I know for sure I can write five to seven thousand words a day if I'm really motoring along. So you know, there you go in the space of a week, and that's how he did it. He sat and he smacked out. Uh, I don't think he got a lot of sleep, but I think he's the kind of person who doesn't sleep a lot anyway. But man, he's a multimillionaire. You know, you can't argue with that. <laughs> so, um, you know, going coming back to my story, I'd, I'd kind of re-outlined the story. And then I sat down, I thought, right, well, I, I, I kind of know, now I know who this character is. Uh, and I'm much happier with the lead character. And, and I need to kind of get the story started and give it a setting and give it a purpose and that kind of stuff. So I sat down and wrote the first chapter. And that was, oh, it was actually now probably about three or four months ago. That's how much time flies, isn't it? Um, and just as I finished that first chapter, and it was pretty much a first draft, I might have gone through it and you know edited out typos and that kind of stuff, but pretty pretty raw, really. There was a, a thing came up. There's a, a group of, I mean, initially it was all women, but I think it now includes men. There's a, a group of independent authors here in the UK called Triskeel Books. Triskeel, T-R-I-S-K-E-L-E, -E, Triskeel Books, and that's a Celtic word. Um, it's some sort of Celtic symbol, Triskeel. Um, but anyway, they uh, are an independent author collective because one of the problems when you're an independent, you know, self-published author is it can be a really, really lonely road. So what it is, it's a group of very highly talented people. Uh, and as I say, initially it was just women. Um, I think they're all authors. I know one of them, Jane Dixon Smith, is also a graphic designer who designs beautiful book covers and, and internal layouts. So uh, and another one of them, I think, has done a lot of editing work. So they kind of, you know, when one of them finishes a book, they send it first to their other pals in this collective who check it and proofread it and edit it and, you know, that kind of stuff. And then Jane, I think, designs all the book covers. And then they help market it together and... Man, it's been really successful. I mean, I think they've been going, now I could, could say, for example, precisely how many, maybe five to ten years. And, in fact, they're just about uh, next month in London putting on their first uh, literary festival in central London, uh, which is, wow, it's quite a big thing, and they managed to invite loads of, you know, really very well-known authors to talk about their books and how they write and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, they uh, they run regular competitions, um, and one of the competitions they run every every year is it's they call it their first page prize, which is basically you send in the first page of your novel, and um, they all kind of assess it, and the winner gets five hundred pounds, and the second place one hundred pounds, and the third place fifty pounds, and then there's a shortlist. So anyway, it was just on a whim. Uh, this competition came out and I thought, well, you know, I need some kind of um, indication as to whether I should type this novel. You know, if, if, it's, if it's crap, tell me now kind of thing. Um, and well, the, on Friday, last Friday, the results came back in and it turned out that I was shortlisted. I was in the top, I think it was about 12 out of something like 400 entries. So you can imagine I was I was a bit pumped about that. <laughs> and um, that's kind of given me a heavy hint 
that I should carry on writing this damn thing, you know. So I've got, you know, chapter one and an outline. <clears throat> I need to finish this puppy. So, yeah, that's... Um, I think a lot of people who know me might be surprised. Oh, Henry, fantasy novel? What's that? Uh, actually, I've been a, f a fan of fantasy fiction since, well, blimey, at, at infant school or junior school, we read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. And then in my early teens, what was I, 12, 13, 14, something like that, I read The Lord of the Rings for the first time and The Silmarillion and The Unfinished Tales and all the rest of it. And in fact, I was chatting with a friend of mine the other day, when I did my year abroad as part of my university degree in Augsburg in Germany, it turns out that Augsburg University Library is world renowned for its collection of works, but works about Tolkien. You know, there's, I think there may even have been a course there on Tolkien studies, that kind of stuff. And it included also to all Tolkien's uh, academic work, because he was a philologist, that, you know, studied ancient languages, that kind of stuff. So all his, you know, Beowulf in the original Anglo-Saxon and, you know, I kind of get, got a fascination for that kind of thing a long, long time ago. But obviously, at the same time, I was doing a history degree. And military history has been a passion of mine as well since I've been a kid. You know, well, anyone who's read the Wargaming Compendium about that. So I've had this kind of parallel life where... Um, Simply because of the way my life and career has turned out, <clears throat> obviously I spent the, and still do spend the vast majority of my time looking at historical war gaming and historical, you know, military history. But underneath that, there's also this desire of mine to write fiction and, and specifically uh, to write fantasy fiction. Uh, because I'm really interested in uh, myths and legends and lore and, you know, fancy worlds and world creation. I think, you know, there's another uh, a hint that people who have followed any of the stuff I've written about, like the Wars of the Faltinian Succession, right? It's set in the 18th century, but, man, <clears throat> I could just as easily have set it, made it a fantasy, completely fantasy world. Um, <clears throat> obviously because of my interest in the 18th century and the way that ties in with what Charles Grant did back in the day and all the rest of it, um, I've got, all, I have got this interest in creating worlds in uh, historical, in inverted commas, <laughs> historical periods, but in completely invented settings. Um, so, you know, it's only a step away from, from, for me to create entire worlds for a more, if you like, sounds weird, doesn't it? A more conventional fantasy setting, you know, um, a kind of sword and sorcery uh, kind of setting. Um, but it's not, you know, I, my intention is you're, you're probably not going to meet elves and dwarves and hobbits in my world. Uh, my world is, and again, I better put this in the inverse commas, much more realistic. Uh, it's much more gritty. It's much more kind of recognisably historically kind of medievalish, um, or early medieval at least. There's um, there's an, a writer um, who's dead now, sadly, called David Gemmell, who wrote a fantastic book called Dross, Dross the Legend. Uh, many of your listeners, their ears may well be pricking up at this point because he, um, I mean, he sadly died a few years ago, but he was an amazing uh, kind of epic fantasy writer. But his stuff is all, it's really gritty. You know, it's much more like George R.R. R. R. Martin, actually. He doesn't pull any punches. You know, there's a lot of blood on the carpet. Uh, but his heroes are real gritty plausible believable heroes who you can uh, well i feel i can identify more with you know they they're, they're not um clean and shiny well bathed they don't shave very often <laughs> kind of thing uh they are um they are facing their demons um in a way that, you know, most of us as we go through life from time to time have to face our demons, you know, that we may not actually be standing in front of a dragon or, or you know, a, a horde of angry 
the invaders, but we've all got our own demons to slay. You know, we've got bank managers to deal with <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, so that's the kind of thing I, I write. Um, and I'd say on my blog, people can read that first page because I, that, on the Triskiel Books website, they posted the first, second, and third place stories first pages um but not the kind of runners up in the rest of the shortlist so i posted mine on my personal blog my non-wargaming blog at um henryhide.co.uk so people can go and read it um and they may like it they may hate it but that's the nature of storytelling isn't it that if you try and write to please everyone you won't please anyone so there we go I've so there you go well, I got to say, I was very surprised when I first um, heard inklings that you were interested in writing this kind of stuff. But it, it's funny because a while back I read uh, an amazing uh, fantasy novel, which you may have read. It got uh, nominated for the Hugo and the Locus Award and I think even the Nebula. It's called The Goblin Emperor, which is kind of a mix of high fantasy, but a lot of court intrigue. So it, it uses um, this half-breed goblin uh, who becomes the emperor and to talk about issues of race and slavery and uh, elitism versus um, those who don't have anything. And he really is interested in kind of fixing all these things, whereas the previous elven emperors had no interest in it at all. So the fact that he's a goblin doesn't really matter. It could take place anywhere. And when I read this, I thought, you know, this is a world that is as rich as the stuff that you create. And in my mind, I thought, you know, if Henry ever wrote something like this, it, I could easily see your name on the cover instead of the, the author's name uh, who wrote it just because of uh, it has a lot of that um, style of what some people I know like to call the fancy wars. So I thought it's very Faltenian succession-esque in uh, setting and, and kind of verging a little bit on steampunk sort of stuff a little bit. Uh, there's, you know, the, yeah. they're trying to build a, a steam bridge because it, it got destroyed and so forth. Um, but mm -hmm. it, just like really rich characters with uh, very everyday kind of problems, even though this guy, this goblin, he's an emperor, but very real threats of people trying to kill him and what does he do? And, um, yeah. everyday lives of people uh but kind of shrouded in this whole world and these greater problems so i can understand why this particular work did so well and so after reading this and then many 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 months later seeing that you were interested in this kind of stuff although i was shocked at first i said you know what it actually it makes perfect sense uh just by reading some of the the stuff you've done with the imaginations uh you are a very gifted world creator and world builder and that's something uh, you mentioned earlier about people buying some of those older issues of battle games. I, I will often tell people if they have any interest in kind of creating their own scenarios and their own settings or things, they need to read, I think it's your first 10 issues, where you really lay out how you created uh, your worlds of Prunkland and Faltonland and what you've done with that. And I, I still use that today uh, with stuff that I, I do, just kind of creating maps and that sort of stuff. I refer to what you've done there to try to help create the That's setting and, and everything. Because I think you've done it so well and so concisely and it's very easy to use and follow. Uh, knowing that you want to do more f fiction makes perfect sense to me. Sure. It's also interesting you say that because actually uh, that compilation I did of the Walls of the Fountain in Succession has, I think, now become my best-selling issue. Um, and I still see pretty much on a daily basis, you know, one or two people have, you know, they trawl through the issues and then seeing that compilation I did, the Walls of the Fountain in Succession stuff, uh, and gone, well, you know, that looks like good value because they're interested in that kind of world creation stuff. I think when, um, you know, the, the, this is where it starts to touch on wargaming because obviously uh, most of our discussion today has veered well away from wargaming and probably there are some people who've tuned in and going, well, hang on a minute, I thought this show's called Wargaming Re Recon. Uh, and it is, you know, and, and alongside this, I am a wargamer. Part of the wargaming I've done in it, Fantasy, uh, not so much science fiction. That's interesting because I love sci fi. And you know, if, if someone said to me straight off, you know, what's your favorite kind of movie? I would probably say sci fi movies. You know, the new Star Wars, uh, Star Trek, and Star Wars, and, and Aliens, and you know, 
the Martian and, you know, back and back and back and back. You know, I like hard sci-fi. Battlestar Galactica is the, the remade version is my, you know, one of my favorite TV series of all time. Um, had a bit of a wobble in series four, but basically um, it's, you know, superb. A Serenity slash Firefly that was stupidly canceled by the studios, you know, that may well actually be my favourite series of all time. And, of course, sadly, it was series singular. Um, but so I love all this stuff. Um, but for some reason, reproducing sci-fi stuff in a war game, was, it's just for whatever reason, hasn't turned me on. For, for Warhammer 40K never turned me on. Um, I've recently had a game of Hammer Slammers. It was in the latest issue of Miniature War Games. Had a game, my first ever game of Hammer Slammers with John Treadaway, um, which I found really interesting because um, it's actually kind of sci-fi, but not very, if that makes any sense to you. it's Because essentially what it is, it's Vietnam in space. Uh, it's, you know, you've got these guys, the hammer slammers, and they're kind of a, an elite mercenary armored unit who get to do all the dirty jobs. And so they're taking on partisans and rebels and terrorists. And, you know, there are some other more formal forces and, uh, they drive around, um, you know, one of the most uh, kind of noticeable things is that the tanks are mostly kind of hover tanks. They have large wheel vehicles, but when you see a tank, instead of it having tracks, it's like a it's like a hovercraft with a gun on top. Interesting concept because, of course, it makes it an all-terrain vehicle. So anyway, I had a go, and it was really interesting. Um, you know, uh, in the in the article that John wrote for the uh, John Treadway wrote for the latest issue of the magazine, he mentioned you know that Henry was slightly taken aback by the suicide bombers. Well, yeah, we don't have many of those in the wars of Valentinian succession. <laughs> you know, you don't get many of them on the battlefield at Blenheim, right? Uh, it was considered not the done thing. So when I was playing this game and suddenly realised I couldn't trust a single vehicle, and there were a lot of vehicles, I couldn't trust a single parked vehicle in this game. Well, I I started doing what the American forces started doing in Iraq, which is like, mate, moat, blow that car to pieces. You know, just stay 100 yards away and just turn your gun on it. To, if it if it makes a big bang, there was something nasty inside it, right? And it's just as well we didn't discover it with our guys on foot. And that's what I started doing and um, ended up winning the game as a result. You know, John was pretty miffed. I hadn't walked into any of his traps. But um, anyway, so that was fascinating. But sci-fi as a genre for wargaming, um, as I say, it's just... Uh, computer games, yes. Uh, I think, you know, there are some amazing, you know, computer games and online games out there where you really do feel like, man, I am flying through space. And I think that's the thing that, for me, the sp uh, is kind of the space combat is what turns me on and that feeling of almost like being in a simulator because I always love flight simulators. That feeling that I can fly anywhere in this thing and, right? Um, and so that's interesting, but fantasy, um, yeah, God, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons back in, I'm trying to remember my first game of Dungeons and Dragons was probably when I was at university, so it would have been about 1979, 1980, something like that, but I'd actually had my first Middle Earth War game at school a couple of years before that, when I was I don't know, about 15 or 16. So that would have been, oh my God, here we go, probably about 1976, 1977. Oh, I'm so old, Jonathan, I'm so old. Um, so yeah, the, that, so that I'd, I'd already associated playing games with forces that weren't perhaps human that maybe were goblins or orcs or hobbits or dwarves or elves or whatever. Um, and so then when I came out the other side, then, of course, the Birth of Games Workshop, you know, let's not go into that history again, but obviously I um, I bought... Um, in fact, I think I bought HeroQuest, Advanced HeroQuest, 
before I bought any of the Warhammer Fantasy Battle stuff. It, you know, but soon after I must have a Fantasy Battle, which must have been like something like that, really early on. Um, I loved it, and you know, actually. Uh, I might have mentioned this before somewhere online, but my thing was Skaven. I fell in love with the Skaven as a as a as an army because I just loved the idea of Ratmen with all their mad weapons that you know blew up as much as they were successful. But if they were successful, they were really successful. And I think the Doom Wheel, the the Skaven Doom Wheel, the original Skaven Doom Wheel, is still my favourite thing ever in Warhammer Fantasy Battle. But anyway, I digress. So. Um, yeah, so that's why I've always... The, the the other thing is, I suppose because I've always been interested in historical wargaming and ancient history and, you know, the 18th century stuff. Um, obviously, fantasy war... There's a, an obvious crossover between ancient and medieval wargaming and f- fantasy battle. Okay. The armor with swords and shields and axes and that kind of stuff. Uh, so essentially, you've got battle in which some non-human characters are often involved. Plus, you've got this weird artillery that comes from wizards, right? Because that's how you can look at wizards, isn't it? You know, uh, uh, and spellcasters is that it's a kind of artillery. You know, they can fire a lightning bolt hundreds of yards into the middle of a melee or something and wipe people out. Well, yeah, take away the wizard, put in a large cannon. It's pretty much the same thing. Um, obviously, there are other things uh, to do with spell casting that you know, we're all familiar with from Dungeons & Dragons, the notion that you could heal people, uh, you could resurrect the dead, or you could suddenly inflict the plague on a load of people. But essentially, you know, if, if you played medieval war games you've got no problem or should have no problem translating that experience across into fantasy battle gaming uh, or skirmish gaming fantasy skirmish gaming because it's essentially it's exactly the same thing you know particularly if you look at um lord of the rings where you know t- quite often the wizards were missing you know the, the, the battle of the two towers I mean, Mithrandir turns up eventually with the cavalry, with the Rohirrim cavalry, but, you know, there's most of that battle is just a slugfest siege kind of scenario that anyone who's played ancient or medieval games would recognise. So that's also where, when it comes to writing, I feel like I've got something to say. You know, when it comes to the battle scenes and fight scenes, I can bring something to the party you know, in, in writing a novel. Um, because also having, I've done reenactment as well. You know, I think we've talked about this before. I was in the SCA. So, you know, I've smacked a few people around the head with a big chunk of wood and I've been smacked around the head quite a few times with a big chunk of wood. I've heard, you know, I've been inside a helmet that literally has rung when someone's hit it, you know. I've my shield split in half, you know. I, you know... When when you've got that kind of experience, both at a nitty gritty level, you know you're literally looking through an eye slit, and that's what you can see. Up to the big, grand tactical level, you know, well, let's send a brigade of orcs in on the left flank. I think that's that's quite useful as a writer. Um, and obviously, there's people like um, Gav Thorpe, who's written a lot of novels for. Uh, what do they call them? A Black Library, which is the the Games Workshop publishing arm, um, and he's written loads. I mean, he's written about fifty novels now, all based in the Warhammer universe, um, which is interesting. I I couldn't stand doing that, but obviously he, for him, it's provided. Well, effectively, it's all provided him with a day job. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> um. I I need to get to meet him because he's you know he's obviously extremely prolific, uh, so I'm sure he's got lots of tips to give. But uh, I wonder how you know does he find it liberating that he hasn't had to come up with a universe himself, or does he find it confining? And does he actually wish you know God if I've got to write another Warhammer 40k novel, I'm going to cut my own head off with a spoon, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't know, do you? Uh, on the other hand, he might love it. Obviously, you know, he probably loves getting paid for it. So that's kind of the writing thing, Jonathan. Um, and that's where it came from. So, yeah, this this thing just the other day where literally it's like, wow, someone not only noticed that I'd written something, but they thought highly enough of it to put in a, on a very short list out of a lot of entries so i was you know the 500 pound first prize would have been nice <laughs> but you know that comes down to the individual taste of the people judging it um and that's the nature of competitions you know you could you might enter one and come nowhere and enter another one and you know win first prize but just you know also this is the other thing that's the first comp writing competition of any kind i've entered since i was at school so you know, uh, so crikey, and it's like for, for 40 years, <laughs> 40 years, Jonathan. How old are you, Jonathan? Since Not old enough. You were born. Uh, <laughs> Since you, before you were born. You might be interested with your uh, you might be your background way back in D and D. And uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, Wargaming Recon is actually part of the TSR podcast network, which is owned by TSR Games, and that has the affiliation with Gary Gygax's sons, yeah. who were involved. But then also Frank Menser yeah. um, and Tim Cass, Tim Cass, who did Dragon Magazine, and Frank Menser, who did I think it's a Red Box. Uh, so I actually get to see Frank and Tim. Um, Every year when I go to TotalCon, they're guests of honor there, and I get to go to behind-the-scenes kind of um, off-the-book sort of events and, and things I'm not allowed to talk about, but really interesting stories about their early days and what it was like to work with Gary and, and the early days of creating D&D and all that kind of stuff. And again, the world building and the, the game design and all that kind of stuff. And I tell you, they are amazing people. Uh, just a lot of knowledge uh, there with them. And I'm I'm actually very grateful, and I don't even quite know how it happened that Wargaming Recon's now you know, become part of the TSR podcast network. Uh, um, it, it's interesting that, it, you know, I got to figure it out because I'm sure I know somehow how, I, I said yes at one point. I, I know I, I did that, but uh, like this is their Wargaming podcast is what it mm -hmm. is. And so it, it's interesting uh, having those kind of connections. And uh, you might also find it interesting. Uh, one thing I like to do in every show, I like to have the mailbag section of the show where listeners can hear their feedback that they've sent in. And um, some of it, I, I think, will be of particular interest to you, uh, basically from things that I've seen you post on uh, Facebook. Uh, but before I dive right into that, I, I just want to say we had uh, a couple bits of email uh, from listeners. I, I had one from uh, listener Mike, who was actually talking about my episode before this. It was the 10 years of Wargaming Recon, who uh, he just kind of said, good luck. It sounds like it's going to be a good one. And then uh, someone who you are very well acquainted with also sent an email. And Neil Shook, also for that episode, uh, said, really well done on 10 years. And uh, for people who listen to that episode, the episode 165, I hope you listen to the end because there's an audio message from Neil in there, uh, which is very nice to, that he actually took the time to do. And I know he's so busy and uh, I, I don't quite know how we managed to do it. Uh, but there's a game designer who, Henry, you might be familiar with. And I'm honestly not sure if you are or not, but I, I think you know his work maybe more than the name. Uh, Russ Lockwood, does that ring a bell with you, Henry? Oh, yeah, that rings bells, yeah. I've not uh, met him, but yes. Uh, from MagWeb, and he's done um, Snappy Nappy and um, yeah. a, a bunch of... Anyway, he's been on the show in the past. I think he's going to be coming on sometime in 2017. He has a couple new things coming out, uh, including something he can't tell me much about just yet, but he's promised he's going to share as soon as he can. But he actually sent me an email as well, also for episode 165, and he said, Congratulations on reaching the 10-year milestone. Always enjoy chatting with a knowledgeable host. Keep up the good work. And then on Facebook, uh, this is going to lead me into something that I think will be of particular interest to you. Uh, you have a very strong interest in giving back. Uh, and it's one of the things I really enjoy seeing that you do. And it's something I'm passionate about as well. Uh, the charity that I kind of work with, the Extra Life Foundation, they work with different area children's hospitals to make sure that there's funding there for kids who have need of medical treatments for things like cancer, cystic fibrosis, and that kind of stuff. But these kids, they don't have the money for it. The families can't afford to pay it, and they're not going to get the treatment if they 
don't have the funds. So this charity makes sure the funds are there. Uh, I, I don't even quite know uh, how they decided to contact me, but for some reason they ended up contacting me, this Extra Life charity, and they wanted to make sure that I knew what I'm sharing with all the listeners, because the listeners here actually have done a lot to help with fundraising. Mm -hmm. Uh, for this charity, yep. and I'm very appreciative for uh, everything that people have done. But uh, Extra Life has said, "quote Over the past four years, you've raised and donated over fifteen hundred dollars for sick and injured kiddos. You're a rock star." And I actually think they mean the listeners are a rock star because it's because of all of you that we have done so well. And a couple listeners uh, are doing something too, and I think it's probably a, a larger UK kind of awareness sort of thing. So I was first made aware of this um, new thing by Stuart Foley from PaintedWarGameFigures.co.uk. Uh, he's known on Facebook as the Jolly Frog Figure Company. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Dave, who is a listener from War Games at Battle Shades Facebook group, and then Alyssa Faden, who you might be familiar with, Henry. She does a lot of cartography. She's You've seen, I'm oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, fantastic stuff. Yeah. Torn Armor and all. She, again, she's coming on the show in um, a future episode. But all of them had made me aware of something that you're involved with, which is the 22 push-up challenge to raise awareness for PTSD and yeah. vets' mental health needs. Uh, I was told by Stuart, and I can't say that I validated the figure, but the stat seems true that every day 22 former army navy and air force members take their lives due to ptsd uh so i told all of them i would make a point of first of all mentioning it on the show and i know you've been doing your 22 push-ups a day so i want to say i've enjoyed seeing that and i hope other people are seeing this and helping to spread the word and making donations to combat stress to help those vets who are uh in dire need of some treatment over there yeah uh i have to point out that it's not well, the British version, anyway, is not doing 22 push-ups every single day. <laughs> I think that would be too much for some people. Uh, I think you just have to do it once and then make a donation to the charity, you know, the, the military mental health charity, which in the UK is, of course, Combat Stress. Uh, so, yes, I did my bit. I did my 22 push-ups. And some people, when, they, when they've done theirs, uh, they uh, then nominate other people to do it. I just said, look, you know, come on. Uh, pull yourself together and go and do your own 22 push-ups challenge. Uh, yeah, it's okay. I mean, I think it's a, man, it's an awful statistic, um, a tragic statistic. Um, and I think that's quite a clever way of using that for something positive. Um, and I know that combat stress in the UK, at least, have had uh, tremendous success with it. Um, I can't, I, I, um, forgive me, I forget what, the, there is a specific charity in the States as well, isn't there, that's, uh, that focuses on m mental health of veterans uh, rather than just kind of physical injuries, that kind of stuff. Um, mm. But anyway, the Veterans Association or whatever it might be, you know, obviously that the, they use the money, you know, it goes to a tremendous cause. So come on, everyone, get down and do your 22 push-ups. You can see mine on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel which you can dig around and find, or it was also on the. Did I put it on the Miniature War Games Facebook page? I think I did. Um, so, yeah. Uh, just do your 22 push ups, give five quid to combat stress or whatever, and, you know, move on. And then I have a few announcements in, as I'd like to say, pay the bills kind of stuff that I also think you might be interested in, Henry. There's a new Kickstarter. Uh, oh, that I think you, I know you love making your maps, uh, but I think you might like this because I, I, I have you in mind whenever I think of this product. It, it's called Hexographer 2. It's a computer program that is very easy to use that allows you to make hex based. Got it. You, you have, do you have the, you have the original right now? I have, of course I have. The, the <laughs> I have to see what other people are up to. Uh, yes, and I, I subscribe to their newsletter. So I heard that they would this version. Well, it, the creator of it's going to be coming on the show. Um, they're doing really well with the Kickstarter. I don't know if you've been following it. They're hoping to uh, raise fifteen thousand dollars, which they've done. They've reached four of their stretch goals now. So there's going to be extra icons. There's going to be extra features for uh, like if you're doing medieval and you want castles, it'll auto generate like information about the castle or a town or, or all that kind of stuff. So you can have, uh, obviously if you're like someone like Henry, you're going to want to add that stuff in yourself because you want to have, you're creating your own world, but the software for 
I've, I've used the first one is amazing uh, for someone like me who doesn't have any of these kind of creative skills or design. Um, if I if I, if I were to draw you a hex, you would laugh and you'd kick me out on the street. Is what I I, I make stick figures like that. Okay, so <laughs> it's true. Something like this is very useful for someone like me. I've used it for uh, historicals. You can use it for uh, role playing games, whatever you kind of stuff you want. You can actually use it like a board game almost to play your game. Like if you wanted to play Command and Colors, instead of doing that, you can get this. You can have a GM. Certain parts of the map can be made visible to players so you can see and you can put your units and things like that. It's very, very cool. You can get in at a, a, a low level, I think. You can still get in and get all the cool extras and stuff. Uh, they're going to be on the uh, show. Actually, I don't know when they're going to be on. I think maybe the next episode. Uh, I might need to check that. Oh, and then <laughs> it, it, it kind of helps for me to know when I got to be where I need to be, uh, oddly enough. And <laughs> otherwise, people tune in and there's nothing, <laughs> just black screen. Yeah. It might, it might yeah. be a little disappointing, right? <laughs> people looking for that yeah. new issue of, of Miniature War Games, and, and you're just on vacation somewhere. Like, what issue of Miniature War Games? They're not, yeah, yeah. they're not gonna be too happy about that um but we've talked about passive income uh throughout the show a little bit and one of the ways that i'm able to bring the show to all of you is i i don't you would think a podcast shouldn't cost money or not much right it should be pretty cheap and i've much to my own chagrin found that's not true <laughs> surprise <laughs> and now that i have a, a child and things like that it less money for this and more money for that. Uh, so one of the ways that I'm able to keep the lights on, so to speak, is by having a sponsor. So I'm very appreciative for the Maine Historical Wargamers Association. They put on Huzzah every year, which is one of my favorite historical wargaming conventions. It's up in Portland, Maine, 15th through the 21st, 2017. And Henry, I know in the past, when you were doing battle games as your own solo independent endeavor, you were able to offer prize support and things like that for their raffles and how appreciative uh, they've all been for that, and I know they're kind of doing stuff with uh, War Game Soldiers and Strategy, and they've made connections with War Games Illustrated and all that kind of stuff. They're a great group of people. They also like to give back. They try to use War Gaming to uh, teach kids about all sorts of different things, social aspects and kind of stuff. So they do a lot of outreach up in Maine for that kind of stuff. So it's a great group, and I'm just yeah. very appreciative that they've decided to uh, say, hey, we're going to give you a little money here for War Gaming Recon and to help out and. Uh, that kind of stuff. I will be actually, uh, I'll be at Huzzah in 2017. I'll be doing a live show, which should be pretty cool. Oh, cool. Then we talked about Patreon. So Patreon for me is the other piece of the puzzle and actually it's becoming more and more the larger chunk of the puzzle. So the sponsorship is great and I'd love to have more sponsors if it's a right fit, but it's really cool to have support from listeners like you because any one of you who's listening, I presume you're listening because you like the show and you like what we do here. You like having guests like Henry on, which is really cool. Um, we can't do it without uh, paying for things like web hosting and all that kind of stuff, uh, equipment and being able to go to places. So having support from backers is huge. So I have to thank some backers here. Uh, I need to thank Patrick. I need to thank Chris Parker from Day of Battle Games. Kyle from Vermont, who is our newest backer. And also Dave and the War Games at Battleshades Facebook group for their support. I have many different backer levels here. You can get in for as little as $1 a month. That gets you all the episodes before everyone else, behind the scenes content and cool stuff. And then I have other levels. Uh, one of the levels is I thank you by name on every episode of the show. You can also get for $18 a month, I will mail to you a set of six custom War Gaming Recon, War Gaming the T6, their Lizard they were done by Christopher, who is another habit and as a, and uh, this is one of the ones that I really like, uh, and I really enjoy because I think it's terrible that the only mail we get nowadays is junk mail and bills. I like that, although people don't write letters anymore, I can do my part and I can do postcards. So for the certain backer level every month, I'll send you a Wargaming Recon postcard and on the back, you know, I'll write messages about what's going on. We can chat and cool stuff. I just think it's nice to get mail that's not trash and not saying you owe us money. <laughs> Call me weird, but I think it's kind of neat. Uh, so I enjoy going to the post office and saying, here's my postcards to send out to, to people. So it's pretty cool to do all of that. And um, I would say what date the next episode is, except 
you would think I'd be more... Actually, I can tell you. It's September 12th will be the next episode of Wargaming Recon, and that's actually when I'm going to talk about Hexographer 2. Uh, Henry, did you end up backing the Kickstarter, or are you going to wait and see how things go with it before you do anything? Uh, no, I'm going to wait and see, because also uh, it's something I was interested in to see how to do it, but obviously the, the way that it generates terrain is completely different from the way I render my terrain and stuff. But it's certainly, because um, I, I get asked a lot, <laughs> Henry, how do you do your maps? You know, whether it's the big maps for the campaigns or the battlefield maps and stuff. And so I say, yeah, well, I use Adobe Photoshop. And they say, oh, yeah, well, I'm not going to pay, you know, 45 pounds a month to, to, to have the Creative Cloud software. So, so how else could I, could, could I do the map? And, you know, I've, well, there is no cheap and easy way to do what I do. But if what you want is a cheap and easy map, well, there, there are these other things. There's kind of about half a dozen bits of software of which Hexographer, I think it's fair to say, is one of the more, most superior ones um so i've obviously been keeping tabs on it and was very interested to see that they were kind of uh upgrading it and certainly for anyone who wants to create a fantasy campaign uh but doesn't feel like they either have the talent or the time to do what i do man use hexographer really it's a no-brainer i've kind of done a, a hybrid version of what you did with your fall in succession in the software so i'll go through and i, I roll the dice uh, I generate a blank map in Hexographer in the first one. I roll the yeah. dice and do all that stuff. And I add it in. So I do part analog and part digital. And then I, after it's all created, I use the digital and continue with it from that way. Just because, like I said, I don't have the talent uh, like you do to to go in and create all the great maps. And um, you touched on it, but we should say again, for people who are interested in Gladius publications in your mailing list, they get two cool, really free gifts. Uh, one of them I've printed out. That's actually a boring picture if you're watching on um, <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on our video, on our live stream. So these are your um, terrain map squares. And I printed these out on 110-pound cardstock. It works just fine on a LaserJet or Inkjet printer. I think they look pretty good. And then you also have, as your other gift, this is your scenario maps, uh, which are kind of cool. Oh, just nice. kind of... A, a quick peek. They look really good. I mean, of course they do. Uh, but again, printed out on 110 pound cardstock. So you could have, you could uh, cut them out and, and make your own maps. And if you blew them up really large, uh, you could really do a very, very, I'm going to say old school kind of um, table. So you get that out and you use that until you want to make 3D terrain. Or maybe you don't. You just use that. And they look really, really nice. And uh, Oh, the, the idea of the, the scenario maps was that I kind of stripped away all the other unnecessary details so people could, even though some of them might have been used for a horse and musket game or a World War II game initially, uh, it's just to show people that, you know, just with a bit of imagination, you can use any map for any historical period or fantasy or sci-fi. Um, and, you know, there's just a few examples. I'm actually working on uh, the, my first book of scenarios, uh, which would probably be World War II scenarios, um, that are going to be fairly generic, which is to say they're not going to be specifically for Flames of War or Rapid Fire or any specific rule set. Uh, the idea being that, um, you know, here's, here's a situation, you've got a platoon of infantry and the other side has got, you know, a platoon of infantry and a couple of tanks or something like that. Uh, you've got to take that town in the middle, off you go. Because I think for a lot of people, uh, you know, if they go to a war games club, quite typically, or they might get together with a friend or two for an evening's gaming. Uh, what they don't want to do is to they turn up and then spend the first hour just thinking, well, you know, what should we play? What should we do? What should, what scenario should we have? So the idea is, look, here's your scenario. Here's here's the terrain you need. Uh, set it up quickly and crack on with your game. Um, and I think, you know, there's quite a big market of scenario books these days, um, and which is one of the things that made me think, well, duh, uh, that's something I can do quite easily and produce attractive maps as well. The idea of the terrain squares is, again, uh, well, they can be used in two different ways. The first way is you can create your own scenario map using those terrain squares. And the same, they're based on terrain squares. You know those total system scenic? 
you know, polystyrene terrain squares. That's the basic idea. So you slap a few of, the, few of those together, bung some trees on top and some houses and your troops and off you go. And the idea is that it was lovely to see you have actually printed them out on card because obviously what you can do is cut them out and then you can actually uh, arrange them on the tabletop before getting out your terrain squares or use those and then use terrain from any other source you know you might have rubber uh, roads and your own trees and stuff uh, but that's a good way of setting things up they can also be used for a campaign a small campaign uh, they can even be used by a solo war game you know you so you're you you can spend an hour kind of discovering terrain as you go along literally by shuffling the cards up print them out multiple times so you shuffle the cards up and then draw them one at a time and that's the next bit of terrain that you've discovered uh, or you could draw them two at a time, so you're just you know, you're you're advancing more uh, each time. Um, and I'm actually working on another one, which is specifically for campaign generation that could be used solo, or could be used by two players. So it would literally be uh, you know your your you the cards will tell you not only what terrain your scouts are discovering as they advance, but also uh encounters with the enemy uh which should me i mean this is partly tying in with my campaigns book that i'm writing for pen and sword uh the idea being that uh you can play a completely solo campaign if you like uh and it should be entertaining and enjoyable you know um as a, as a kind of card-based game so there you are jonathan that's kind of as much as I can say about me at the moment, and I, I need to go have my dinner. <laughs> I know we're wrapping up, but can you say how much further uh, you have to go before you can finish that campaigns book, before we'll be able to get it in our hands? Oh, I, I'm at the very rough first draft stage, and, well, because of all the things that have happened recently, I'm not giving any specific things. I mean, Pen and Sword, I'm hoping to get that... Uh, certainly the, the main first draft all finished by the end of this year. Uh, if it goes better than that, that's fantastic. You know, if I actually manage to get the des the design and layout done as well, I'll be over the moon about that. But if nothing else, so I can get it off my back. And I'm sure Pen and Sword will be over the moon as well. Uh, but I'm not going to be stupid and make any specific promises because I've got so you know so many irons in the fire at the moment so many pies in the oven um i but that's my intention is to have the campaigns book finished written by the end of this year and therefore it would be published sometime in 2017 so you know i i had really hoped that i wouldn't be writing another book that would take me four years <laughs> But the reality is that, you know, the Wargaming Compendium that's behind your head there um, took about four years to write. And my, my life, you know, because my life was tumultuous. And I blithely thought well, that was much calmer now. <laughs> Not quite like that, has it? So there we are. It's about... It, it's a wargaming book every four years, folks. That seems to be my rate of production. But, I mean, we're talking about these are the big ones. Uh, and then the next ones after that are going to be based on my shot, steel and stone rules. Uh, the, the books for pen and souls. Uh, so there's definitely going to be the, the full horse and musket version as a standalone work of some description. And I set up a Facebook group uh, where we are discussing ancients variations, English Civil War variations, American Civil War variations. You know, it's uh, that's one of the benefits of having designed, if you like, a, a, a rule system, is that immediately becomes apparent that you can make adaptations to make it fit you know, pretty much any period from ancient times up to probably, you know, colonials would be the last thing or the late wars in Europe, kind of 1870 or thereabouts. Um, you know, once modern mechanised warfare comes in, it's completely different because uh, you need different rules mechanisms to cope with that simply because of modern rates of fire are so much higher, movements are so much faster, and, you know, aeroplanes and long-range artillery. Um, 
But certainly, you know, I'd already, and I told this to someone else. Who did I tell this? Was it you? Was it Neil Shuck? It might be Neil Shuck on View from the Veranda. That actually, uh, the first version of my Shot Stealing Stone rules was actually an Ancients version. Uh, but because of the deadline of the book, um, I switched to it being a horse and musky version simply because in ancient and medieval warfare, obviously you have so many different weapon and armor combinations that make it actually much more complicated than you might think to begin with. So whereas with in the horse and musket period, it's a bit like paper, scissors, stone, isn't it? That most most infantry is pretty similar most cavalry is pretty similar most artillery is pretty similar with a few variations but uh back in ancient times obviously you might be up against someone who's got leather armor on or canvas armor or steel armor or bronze armor you know with a huge range of weaponry as well but the ancients so that what that means is that probably after the horse and musket version the next version will be the ancients version and in fact, in secret, I've actually got at least a couple of guys doing some early playtesting on that. Um, hello, Jay. If Jay's listening, watching this, uh, uh, he's. Um, so, yes, I've already got encouragement to get an ancient version out. And because of my own gaming, you may have seen in the magazine that I've been I've plunged headfirst into the English Civil War in 10 mil. Uh, so, man, I'd better get an English Civil War version of my rules working as soon as possible. Um, so there we go. So, yeah, lots and lots happening, lots of irons in the fire. But the main thing is I need to start earning some money <laughs> from Gladius. <laughs> Well, if listeners want to uh, stay up to date with what you're doing with that and everything, what's the best way for them to stay current? Oh, very simple. Uh, they can go to www.gladiuspublications.com, which is the website. And we have a Facebook page, don't we? Gladius. I think it's Gladius Books is what it's called on Facebook. And, and it's at Gladius Books on Twitter because there's a limit to how many characters you can have in a Twitter username. And Gladius Publications was far too long. So uh, it's at Gladius Books on Twitter. Um and yeah so they all tie in because i i think i now have four person four split personalities on twitter because i have at battle games i have have at miniature wg which is miniature war games i have uh, at gladius books and i have at henry underscore underscore hide as well so um yeah probably what i should do is just merge them all smush them all together uh but I think it helps sometimes when you're running in, in business terms to keep kind of separate things separate. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I can be found. Uh, and just, you, if you see me at a show, just come up and poke me, you know, that's, <laughs> that'll do. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on this episode of Wargaming Recon, Henry. I'm so glad you were able to fit it in. I know how busy you are, and it sounds like you're even busier. So thank you for taking the time to come on with us here. It's been a pleasure, as always. You're welcome, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure for me, and thank you for having me. Well, I want to remind everyone that you can get the show notes for this episode by visiting wargamingrecon.com slash WR166. That's wargamingrecon dot com slash wr166 well i'm sure all my listeners are going to be excited about gladius publications and no matter how busy you are no matter what's going on in your lives you know you have to you gotta you need to keep on